Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our JCC. It's nice to see you online. And we are going to start with declarations of interests. Are there any declarations of interest? None? OK. Now, before we go into the agenda, I would like to pay a tribute to Loretta and Audrey Moore, two people who passed away. Sorry, Audrey King, sorry. Audrey King, sorry. Loretta is Jerry's wife, and Audrey King is a member of Long Thornton. She's a member of Faith and Belief and lots of other functions. So I would like us to have a one minute silence for them both beginning now. Okay, thank you. You're on mute. You're muted. Sorry, can I say something? Yeah. Audrey, Audrey King is a member of Merton Seniors Forum as well. And uh, I'm the chair for Merton Seniors Forum. I'll be attending a funeral tomorrow. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, chair, can I also say something? Can I just mention Mrs. De Souza, who lives in Garden Avenue? She's a member of BME Voice. And a deco, and she passed away last Thursday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can I mention her as well? Oh my days! Sorry, what's her name? Mrs. De Souza. Hannah Neal, you know, is she's from BME Voice and also a deco, and she plays a very pivotal role in BME Voice. Okay, the mayor soul rest in peace. Okay, anybody else? We should know that passed. Okay, now. We move on to minute, um, apologies of absence, sorry. I have Councillor Adam Bush, who said he will be late. Councillor Bailey, who is absent today. And Councillor Hannah, and Hannah Neal, who is absent today. Any other? Also apologies from Slavic, um, Polish Family Association, and Simon Chimmins from Merton Connected. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. That's, that's all right. Minutes of the previous meeting. That's item three. Are these minutes read and are they agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. We move on to item four, Fostering in Martin by Rosie Bailey. Hi. Thank you. So I'm Rosie. I'm the Fostering Recruitment and Publicity Officer of the London Borough of Merton. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk through um, fostering, why children come into care and what makes a good foster carer. And ideally, what I'd like to do is just kind of, I suppose, put my face out there and then make links with your organisations. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I'm Rosie. I'm the Publicity and Recruitment Officer. Um, I don't know. I'm going to take it that no one knows anything about fostering. So um, what fostering is, is it's a, a way of providing a stable family environment for children and young people who can't live with their birth families. It can be anything from one night to a number of years. And the nature of fostering is that you never know how long a placement might be. That said, you, if you're a foster carer, you could, for example, specialise in short term or longer term placements. Um, and I suppose it's very important to say that a fostering placement is a last resort. We will always be looking to work with the birth families to stop a child from coming into care. But if it looks like for whatever reason the child can't remain at home at that moment in time, then we'd look for somebody in their immediate circle of family and friends. And it's only if we can't find somebody suitable that then we look for a foster care placement. And that's ideally in the local area because we want to keep the children in their communities and at their schools. 
Um, so that's that. Um, and so, yeah, a child will stay in a foster care placement until they, they either can go home or they might move on to a longer term placement or in some cases go to a, for adoption. Um, Merton has approximately 150 looked after children and 70 foster carers. We're a small borough. Um, we've got, I've been working for Merton for five years and most of the people I work with have been there for between five and 20 years. And that's the same with our foster care. So it's a nice, stable place to work and everyone knows each other. Um, unfortunately, though, my job never stops because there's a national shortage of foster carers. Um, and I think a child comes into care every 20 minutes. So we're always recruiting for foster carers and we are looking for people to look after children of all ages, from babies to 18 year olds. There's a particular need for teenagers. Also, unaccompanied asylum seeking children and brother and sister groups. So we don't want to, um, we want to keep brother and sister groups together if they come into care. And then also babies and parent and child placements. Um, there is no one typical foster carer. Typ foster carers come from all different walks of life. Um, and to become a foster carer, you have to have some childcare experience. You don't necessarily have had to have had your own children, but you need to show that you have some experience. You need to be patient, understanding, resilient. You need to be a good listener. A child needs to be able to trust you and that you will become that child's advocate. Um, you need to have compassion for them. Um, you need to have a spare bedroom. Um, in terms of gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation or disabilities, we're inclusive of everything. And um, you can be unemployed or you can be on benefits and you can still foster. You can rent, um, you can own your own home, you can work. You know, so that it's, there's been a few people think if they're single they can't foster but you just have to be able to think about how your work life will work with a foster child so that i'll go i can go into it in more detail um if i speak to you separately but you have to be over 21 you have to have leave to remain um in the uk and yeah i think the most important thing is compassion for the children and and kind of walk with them as you go through their journey um in terms of the reasons why children come into care there are there's so many different reasons it might be they might be experiencing domestic violence abuse and neglect at home there might be alcohol or drug misuse issues there might be mental health problems there might be toxic trio which is where you have alcohol drug and mental health issues feeding into each other a parent might not have been coping they might have gone to prison they might have died um so all of those children and young people are going to have suffered some trauma and loss but you never foster alone and you um get a lot of training so you you will have your own social worker the child will have their own social worker there's somebody on call three and 24 hours a day 365 days a year and i can i can go into it in more detail but um it's, it's a quite intensive process to become a foster carer because obviously we need to make sure that we're placing those children in a safe and secure environment and it takes between three and six months um you get paid to be a foster carer it depends on the age of the child and your level of experience, the amount that you get paid, but it ranges from £312 to £514 per week per child. We also give you a startup grant of £500. You get money towards the children's birthdays and their Christmas or religious festivals, and then also money to take them on holiday. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, training and support. So once you're fostering, you would have your own social worker. The child has their own. Um, no matter how long you've been fostering, you'll always be learning. So there's always training and developmental programs to go through, go on. In your first year, I think it's six, and then it goes up to 12. Um, we've introduced something called the Mockingbird Project, which is it came over from the US, and it's basically it takes the idea that it takes a village to raise a child. So it's a, an extended family network. That's the kind of basis of it for um, foster carers and children in an, in a kind of constellation family, which I can go into more detail there's also a, a buddying program so when somebody is approved as a foster carer if they for example were looking after younger children we'd match them with an experienced foster carer in that age group and they would meet with them for once a month for, throughout their first year um, that is a very very kind of top overview way of kind of going through everything about fostering and um, because what I was wanting to do was kind of just kind of get my face out there and kind of say look, this we we want to basically kind of get out there and speak to different organizations um to see if anybody knows anyone who they think might become a good foster carer um because as i said there is a real shortage of foster carers so um yeah i'm kind of can, my job never stops and we're always recruiting and for the first part of the pandemic we saw a really big increase 
of people inquiring but it's there's the national trend at the moment that they've kind of it's declining so um yeah but obviously unfortunately the number of children are coming into care is increasing so we're kind of i just need to recruit more carers basically so yeah that's that's everything from me i don't know if anyone has any questions at all Uh, okay. Yeah. Any questions for Rosie? Yes. For Jody, sir. Rosie, Rosie. Yeah, you have three hands up, Marcy. You have Agatha and... I can't see them. Yeah, I understand. Right, so Agatha and then Logie and then Joan. Agatha. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, uh, Rosie, for... Um, laying out what the foster parent uh, carers, or foster parents, what well, I call them, uh, that you're looking for and what they do. I think we've got great foster parents, carers in Merton. Um, I was on the foster parent in adoption board in wow. years, and I still, I still um, work with the foster carers. But I do have something, I think, that if we want foster carers, we need to be able to support them more. Mm -hmm. I know they support them, but there's sometimes there's issues. Mm -hmm with the foster parents, or maybe with the children, and I feel the foster parents feel they don't get enough support. Support. So if, if you want to get more people, you know how word of mouth, you know, goes yeah, around. That's you need really to make sure that you're looking after the foster parents, no matter what the issue is, you yeah. have to make sure that if there's an issue and you're dealing with it, you have to go back and make sure that the foster parents are okay. Because yeah. if you don't leave them, you leave a bitter taste in their mouth and then yeah. you're not going to get more people because word goes round. Yeah, yeah. No, so you have to, you know, you know, it's all right advertising for more people, but you have to look in the background what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. absolutely, I agree. I do agree. I think that's part of, you know, the Mockingbird project that we introduced, I think it was last June, because um, that's, I think that's helping to kind of make them feel more supported. And I hope, I deal directly with the level four carers and I kind of, I, I think they do feel well supported but obviously it's it's always good to people do leave and it's important to find out why so we make sure that they don't go to other boroughs or resign or whatever it might be so no it is definitely very important and something that we need to kind of keep on building upon so thank you for that um who is the next person logi is it logi logi yeah uh, i want to i had a a Zoom meeting with um, one one service this morning. Uh, what I could ask is, so when you match the child with the foster parent, and if the child is uh, uh, on the verge of committing suicide, mm -hmm. taking too much of medication, mm -hmm. do you have to be reported? Who reports your back to the uh, social worker, foster parents or the uh, hospital? That's a good question. I have to say, I'm the front side of it so I do the I do I don't get involved in that side but I'm the recruitment and publicity officer but I would imagine so if it comes from the, the hospital to the social worker it should go yeah, to because the social the, worker and, yeah. Yeah, the, the reason is um, the, the child went to these foster parents on the 6th of January mm -hmm. and uh, and this happened on the 7th of January she had been self-harming herself mm. and then she had uh, that uh, the foster parents called in the 111 service Mm. And then I was listening to the whole the commentary the whole lot. Mm. But I was surprised that um, nothing further had been done to safeguard the child. I would I have thought, thought yeah. yeah, that's why I was yeah. just, I was just worried about how these people, first parents should have done something about it because the, the, the narrative I heard in the call, uh, uh, one one call is so frightening that our oh, other side, uh, side was virtually virtual committed suicide, really. Oh. I, yeah, that sounds, I, I don't know the ins and outs of the protocol, but you would have thought that they would have gone back and that would have been yeah, I thought reported what, yeah. because there is, I, as foster carers, they have to um, fill out day logs. So in terms of if, some, if there's been an incident, say, for example, if you're looking after a toddler and they fell over, you would have to say, you would have to record the fact that they'd fallen over, you know, so, uh, but in terms of, any, and I would have thought that that would have gone back, but I don't know the ins and outs and I don't kind of get. No, she's, 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 sorry, she, uh, I don't. I don't mention them first. But she had eight uh, paracetamol. She had eight I, ibuprofen, mm. and she had a lot of medication. It was terrible. I mean, I just couldn't understand why nothing done about it. No, no, no. You would have thought that they absolutely should have been. Um, 
I, yeah, I don't know the ins and the outs of that one. And um, so my job is just literally to kind of raise awareness for the need of foster carers. But have they been in touch with the social work or have you been in touch with the... Well, I mean, uh, as I said, I mean, this is... Uh, I, I hope that the whole subject would have cleared, but I don't know because uh, the, 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 it was involved with a nurse and they were started to take her back to the St. George Hospital for that. Mm. And I don't know the full story what happened after that. I don't right. know. I mean, yeah. No. Sounds very traumatic, though. I, hope, I, think, you know. I think the social worker would be involved. I mean, they wouldn't, because otherwise you can't go back to the foster parents. So I think they would have to be involved in it. Yeah, okay, I'll find out. Thank you. No worries, sorry not to be um, any more help. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Sure. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, okay, um, I think the reason, for some of the reason why at the moment we are lacking having um, foster carers, some foster carers, um, you know, they feel like they're not being supportive, as you know, I, I know Agatha said the same thing, and they're not being listened to. Because mm. sometimes what we must realize mm. that when those children are within the foster carer's house, they're in a family and they're the first port of call where their children are concerned. Mm. And sometimes when they do, I mean, I've experienced, not with only myself, but with other people, when they do report issues to social workers, mm. sometimes they don't really listen to mm. and understand where the foster care care is coming from and of course some foster carers really get depressed they don't want to do it anymore i know foster care will be in foster care for many years mm. and you know issues and concern happens and mm. yet let to believe that they are not worthwhile after working over 20 years within a service and mm. you know these are things that we need to look into and how we can address issues differently and also when um assessing young people to put in foster care and especially when you have a single person or a single, you know, woman caring, you have to really look into the child who you're putting in that care. Is that child, you know, a child, as we say, mm -hmm. you know, what is the situation? Because, mm -hmm. you know, many times foster carers end up having a child who is 16 and end up realize that the child is 25. Yeah. And that sometimes have a big problem. So we need to look into the assessment, you know, in different ways. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I don't, again, I don't. Um, I don't have much to do with the matching side of things, but yeah, absolutely. That I will raise it. I'll go, I will mention that because we do need to make sure that our foster carers are feeling well supported. Because as we said earlier, if they're, if they're not, they're not going to hang around. And it is a very demanding and incredibly rewarding role, and they should feel absolutely supported. You have another hand up, Marcy. Who is that? Yes, a gentleman. What's his name? Yes. Uh, it's me, Ben. Hi there. Sorry, ben. Just Rosie. Sorry, just sorry to interject. Siva, you're, you're sh oh. Sorry. sorry. I'm sharing. Oh, Shiva, share the screen. Sorry. Yeah, Somebody. Shiva, you're sharing your screen. Could you stop the screen share, please? I think he's muted. Oh, he's all right now. Yeah. No, okay, I just said. Okay, a, let's get then. Sorry, I just had a quick question, Rosie, just mm -hmm. to understand the process. Who carries out the assessment and who is responsible to decide whether the child or young person will go in residential care or foster care? Or does the young person have a say in whether they want to be in a residential setting or in a, in a foster setting? A foster. I don't understand the process of that. Generally speaking, the kind of the way that we think that children are better in in foster homes these days. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, it was probably more of a kind of leaning towards residential. So what we ideally are push, we would prefer is for a child to go through to a foster family. Um, and if for whatever reason, I spoke to a foster, I was on a call earlier with a foster carer and she had had a little girl with her for three years and it hadn't worked. She's a really experienced foster carer, but it, th that child needed they, she either needed a family which was with her 24-7 um, and she needed a lot of therapy. So she, the child ended up going to a residential home and actually that was the right place for her because she would have, she could go to school there, she'd have a lot of therapy and she'd have one-on-one -on -one, um, care. So it kind of depends on the child and how, because there's no, you know, you don't know. So I, you know, might have one child go to a foster care placement and it might not work they might move on and go to a different family and it, and it might be brilliant so you don't you don't know I, our first step is always 
to go to foster care families because we think that families are the best places but obviously sometimes that can't, that's not always the case so it depends on the child and the individual but also it's um there's a placements team so you have so i'm the foster and recruitment team so my job is to kind of recruit foster carers once you've gone through the whole process of becoming a foster care which is a very intensive process obviously it has to be because we need to make sure that the children are going to be placed in a safe secure environment but once you're approved you then go to the fostering team and then when a child comes into care they'll go to the fostering team and they'll look at the available social uh, foster carers that are available and see whether or not they think they've got a suitable match and if they think that that's a suitable match they'll contact the foster carers and they'll have the referral form on the child and then the foster carers will look at the referral and they'll think, OK, I don't think this is going to work or yes, I think it will. And if we can't find a suitable foster carer, then we have to go and look at IFAs, so independent fostering agencies. Um, and I used to sit next to the placements team and it was for residential care. It's quite rare, basically, these days. It's only it's only if kind of every other option has kind of been exhausted and it doesn't feel right for that child. So it's kind of. It's, it's kind of then it's, it's the last resort but it can really work for children some some of them but it's not what we would prefer we prefer to find the right family for them um so yeah thank you very much no sure. worries thank you thank you very much Any grace, you have grace yeah hi yeah. hi hi, hi. This grace. Might be, hello can you hear me yep yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, might be a difficult question, but um, I was wondering how many children on average you have that you're looking for foster care for? And my second part is how, what percentage of them are from the uh, ethnic minority or from a black background? OK, the okay. first question, we roughly have about 150 children in care and we've got about 70 foster carers. Um, the second question, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find out for you. Um, we have a sufficiency strategy, so I can I can find that out and I can contact it with you for those details if you want. Thank you. Yes, and sorry, I assume not... that's children between you know, newborns right up to what? 16? To 18. Yeah. So yes. anything from uh, naught to 18. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer to the first one, but I can find it out and I can get your contact details from Everett and email it to yeah. you. That'd yeah. I think, I think Rose, if you send it to me, I'll share it with all of the JCC. Yeah. I think that's a question yeah. everyone would like. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then should I send you my presentation? And I've got a welcome pack as well. So basically, um, yeah, maybe I'll send you some information tomorrow, Everett, and you can have a yes, look over please, it. Yes, please, and then I'll forward and that on. Forward yes, on. Please. Yeah, perfect. And, and obviously your contact details as well, so people yeah. can contact you directly. Yeah, yeah that would be brilliant. Thank you. And I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Oh, yeah. Any Hi. other questions? Yeah, just a quick one from me. I thought it would go up until 16, but you just said to 18. 18. Does that yeah. mean 16? Yeah. Does that mean post 16 is treated differently from 16 and under? Is there a no. special? No, 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 it's not to 18. Um, so it's not to 18. And there is something called staying put now, which has been introduced for the last couple of years. So not many 18 year old children leave home at 18. So now if you're in a foster care placement and if your foster carer wants and you want to, um, you can stay put. So if you're in education, you don't have to, you can stay with them up until some cases 25 and some cases up 21 to 23. So it just means that you don't, you know, you're not, you're still part of that family. Um, so there's not, there was a cutoff before when you were 18 and then you kind of were, deemed as off you go but it depends on um it depends on the circumstances but i do know quite a few foster carers that have staying but but yeah it's anything from babies to up to 18 and i all my job never stops as i said so i'm always looking for people for foster carers but the we do have a big need especially for people to look after teenagers and then i'm a company asylum seeking children and um brother and sister groups but it does change so sometimes we need more parent and baby carers sometimes we need more baby carers so it just it never you just you never you never know basically so my job is just to recruit people to look after children of all ages um so yeah one more question with um what's happening um ukraine. geographically mm. with ukraine and um the encouragement for families to you know for uk to take on you know to offer their homes mm -hmm. are you envisaging 
taking on more children from Europe, from Ukraine? And will that put, you know, again, an immense pressure on the borough? I don't, I I think that it's, um, I I think it's a very difficult question to ask. And I, I kind of, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong in thinking this, but I think that it maybe will be more families, but it's such a difficult question to know. Mm. I mean, I think that when that our, the government website went live, it crashed pretty much automatically because of the demand. So, um, yeah, I suppose I can't really answer that question. But again, as I said, I'm just always continually looking for more foster families. Um, and, you know, sometimes, yeah, they, they kind of, as I mentioned earlier, the groups kind of changes in terms of which groups you need more um, priority carers for. But yeah, no, um, can't answer the question. But hope, yeah, hopefully, if I just keep recruiting more carers, we'll we'll be able to help in some way. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, thanks, Rosie. Thanks, thanks for you, your presentation. No worries. Thank you. Everybody. Look, look out in your emails for you some details of fostering from Everett. Yeah, thank you very great. much. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a nice evening. Yeah, thank you. Too. Thank we'll you. now move to item five, suicide prevention, and that's by Jody Ferris. Everybody, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Jodie. I'm a suicide prevention coordinator from from Mind in Brent, Wandsworth, and Westminster. Um, and I'm here with my colleague Helen. I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself quickly, Helen. Hello. Good evening. Um, I'm Helen, and I'm the team leader for the North and Southwest Suicide Prevention and Postvention Services, which covers 14 boroughs. Yeah, and Martin is one of those. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, so let me know when you can all see that. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, thank you. Great. So the um, project that we're doing is um, commissioned by South West London CCG, um, and it's across um, six boroughs in South West of London, and Merton is one of them. Um, and as part of the project, there's there's a lot of different things going on, but one of them is um, my role, which is as a coordinator, to reach the wider community and talk to them about suicide prevention. So that's what I'm going to be doing um, here today. Um, we do have a longer session, about an hour, but today I'm just going to do 20 minutes so you can get an idea and a feel for the kind of awareness that I'm raising. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions as well. Um, obviously we are talking about suicide today so if um, anybody needs to take a break or step out or kind of come out of the meeting and join back afterwards um, it'll be 20 minutes long um, so yeah please do do take care of your own well-being and step out if you need um, and I'll provide our contact details afterwards as well for me and Helen um, so you can contact us if you've been affected by anything we've talked about today. Um, there'll also be signposting options at the end so um, you can make use of those if you do feel like you need them. Um, but yeah, my main message is this can be a difficult topic so please do take care of yourself um, and yeah, leave at any point, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about kind of understanding suicide and, and it is something that does happen within uh, the borough of Merth and, and it does affect our communities and um, I looked into um, the link between suicide and ethnic minorities and um, just kind of for this group and there's mixed research some research suggests that they're at greater risk and some research suggests that um, ethnic minorities might be at lower risk so it's quite early on um, but I think it's really important um, for, for everyone here I guess to be looking out for those in our community who may be at risk um, so it is the act of intentionally taking your own life and it can be all the way from kind of just thoughts about ending your life all the way to actually planning methods, thinking about it and, and making those clear plans and, and taking action. Um, and it's actually one in 20 people that will experience thoughts of suicide and that comes from um, a recent NHS digital survey. So it really shows that a lot of people will be um, kind of feeling this way um, and that's just within the last year and, and in our lifetimes it's more one in five. So it's, it's a high number of people. Um, and it can be seen as this kind of combination between too much pain and too few coping strategies. Um, and of course, it is really devastating for everybody who is left behind. Um, and we believe that it can be preventable and, and research suggests it's a really preventable death. So if we're all kind of doing our bit. Um, we're hoping that we can save lives um, within our communities. Um, I want to briefly touch on how suicide may be related to trauma, because I think this is an important point, um, which is that 
suicide isn't a problem in itself it's often this attempt to solve a problem um, and it's the distress the emotional pain that can cause a real um kind of problem for someone and suicide can be that attempt to release it um, and this distress can be caused by many different um, underlying factors, um, such as adverse childhood experiences. So um, anybody who's growing up with um, difficult life circumstances um, may be at greater risk. So this is things like neglect, abuse. Um, we just talked about foster um, carers, so children in care. Um, anybody growing up who's been um, a victim of uh, prejudice or discrimination, um, poverty, anything like that can be um, a trauma that can lead to um, increased suicidal thoughts um, when someone is an adult. Um, in terms of risk factors, um, there is many different ones that, um, that there can be and they can fall into these four categories here. So it could be demographic factors or social factors, stressful life experiences, and also interpersonal and intrapersonal factors. Um, but the most important thing is that anybody can be at risk of suicide. So it's really important that we are kind of um, looking out for, for those and um, not assuming that certain people might be more at risk when actually it can be any of us. Um, but some of the research suggests that these are some of the highest risk groups. Um, so anybody who's experiencing socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, middle-aged men we know are a high risk group, alcohol and substance misuse, um, those who self-harm and have made a previous suicide attempt, uh, mental illness, um, bereavement of someone who has died by suicide, um, domestic violence, and also being part um, of the LGBTQI plus community or um, any other discriminated against group. So um, this list is by no means exhaustive. Um, there's many different risk factors, um, but these are just some things to bear in mind if you are supporting someone who may be um, feeling this way. Um, in terms of what you can do, there's so many things that we can all do to look out for people and um, make sure that we are supporting those in our community. And um, the most important thing is just being able to kind of recognise these signs and then ask someone if they're feeling suicidal so that we can get them the right support. Um, these are some of the signs that you might see in somebody who is suicidal. So um, the main takeaway is any changes. So changes in behaviour, changes in mood, changes in appearance, changes in how they talk. So I think saying they can't go on or people might be better off. Um, anything like that. Um, and that can be a sign. Um, obviously, there's, there's lots here and, and there's more as well. But I think the most important thing is that you are recognising any um, changes and you'll know the people that you work with and that you support the best. So um, hopefully you'll be able to notice these changes. Um, but you always want to ask if you do have this gut feeling. So it's really important um, that you kind of ask the question if you are worried. Um, we know that that doesn't increase risk. Um, it's been kind of well documented and researched that um, it can reduce someone's risk by opening up that conversation. Um, so you might want to start by telling them what you've noticed, your reasons that you're concerned, um, and then just kind of coming out the question and saying, are you having these suicidal thoughts and um, allowing them to, to talk about it with you. Um, you really want to listen at that point and make them feel heard and understood. Um, so you can do this by reassuring them, using active listening skills, um, not trivialising what they're saying um, and not giving them solutions at this point, but, you know, really listening and making sure they feel heard. Um, we also want to avoid any judgmental language. So anything like don't do something silly um, and also um, the word committed as well so committed suicide um, was something we want to move away from and instead we might want to use died by suicide or took their own life um, just to try and uh, destigmatize suicide and, and make sure that we are able to talk about it without shame um, and that means that more people can be open about the feelings they're having and we can get them to the right support. Um, obviously, once somebody has um, kind of told you that they might be feeling this way and you've, you've kind of collected that information, um, you might want to um, create a safety plan with them. Um, so obviously, if you're doing this professionally, you want to um, follow your organisation's safeguarding protocols, make sure you're aware of who is the designated safeguarding lead, um, and you might want to involve somebody else that may be part of the procedure, as well as signposting. Um, but the safety plan is just about um, being collaborative with the other person and talking to them about um, how they might be feeling and what they might need to stay safe. So this could be as simple as a soothing or distracting activity, or it could be um, getting rid of uh, access to means. It could be getting to a safe place, informing other people, getting that support network. 
Um, and then on the um, right, there is the CPR acronym, which you might just want to bear in mind when you are um, collecting information about how they're feeling or conducting a risk assessment. Um, so starting with their current plan and, and their intentions, their thoughts, what they've kind of started to do if they have what their prior behaviour is like, so if they felt like this before, um, and if they've uh, kind of taken anything or they've made any, kind of any um, prior steps. And then thinking about their resources as well. So do they have access to means, but also do they have resources to keep them safe? So do they have a support network? Can they get to a safe place? Of course, if they are ready to disclose, um, if they are um, ready to act and they disclose the plan and they intend to carry it out, this will be an imminent risk. And if there's an imminent risk, then it's really important that you um, stay with them until an ambulance arrives and make sure that they can get to A&E safely um, so they can be supported from there. Um, it's also important really to look after yourself whenever um, you're dealing with a disclosure of suicide or when you're supporting anybody who may be at risk. Um, and just this is a, a small reminder just to put on your own mask, oxygen mask first. Um, kind of refocus on yourself after an intervention and make sure that you are really um, taking care of your own well-being. Um, and some ways to do that is to have these clear boundaries. So not keeping any disclosures of suicide a secret. Um, you can uh, discuss the limits of confidentiality. So let them know that you will be passing on this information. Um, you want to report your concern in the appropriate way and um, following your safeguarding procedure within your organization um, and always ask if you're unsure so make sure you're checking that you are kind of you know you do know the procedures you are doing that right thing so that you don't have to hold that that worry or that anxiety um because we know this can be an anxiety uh, provoking thing to be doing supporting someone um, and we do have these worries about are we doing the right thing are we saying the right thing um, and then you want to seek support after you've dealt with a disclosure um, so whether that's within your organisation or whether that's personally um, how you unwind and practice self-care. Um, the next couple of slides are some signposting options. Um, these can be for you, they could be for anyone that you know um, or anyone that you are supporting who may be at risk. And they all um, are within the southwest of London. So firstly, we have the recovery cafes. Um, there is three here, but um, if you follow the links, you can find out more about their opening times and referral forms. We also have men's sheds um, and we're um, hoping for there to be one in every single borough. So men's shed is coming to Merton. Um, but these are the ones that are a little bit more established. Again, you can just follow the links. Um, you do have access to these slides um, in the agenda. So please do follow the links and um, you can find out a bit more. Um, in terms of local suicide prevention support, we have the mental health crisis line, which you can always provide someone or, or for yourself, um, as well as the CEDARS Saving Life program, the Listening Place, and also Maytree. Um, they all offer different types of support for people who may be suicidal. So um, again, if you follow these links, you can find out more and you can find a referral form to get people to the right support. Um, and then we also have our local suicide bereavement support. So this is delivered by us in mind in Brent, Wandsworth and Westminster. Um, and it is for anybody who has been bereaved by suicide. Um, it's Caroline and Harry Maladresses there, who is the suicide bereavement liaison in the southwest of London. Um, she gets most of her referrals via um, the hub, which is um, from the police. Um, but if you do email um, Caroline, she can send you a referral form if you do know of someone who has been bereaved by suicide um, and would benefit from her one to one support. Um, in terms of national mental health support, um, it's always important to check that people know that these exist. So um, you can go to your GP for mental health support. There's also Rethink Mental Illness, um, the National IAP service, um, where people can refer um, for talking therapies for their mental health, um, and also local minds like ours. Um, and you can kind of check and, and see which um, services exist within the area um, and yeah, help, can help people access the right support. And then finally, we have some helplines. Um, so this is just um, for you to provide to others as part of their safety plan. Um, check they feel comfortable using these type of um, sources of support. Um, but it can just be um, a helpful resource as they're um, open 24-7. So Shout is a tech service and Samaritan is a call service. Um, and then there's also Calm for men and Papyrus for young people. Um, in terms of helpful resources for supporting someone, I've put together a few. Um, the first one is the most important one. So this is the Stay Alive app. 
Um, if you have a smartphone, I'd really recommend downloading it because there's lots of free uh, suicide prevention um, information on there. Um, and then here's a few others that could be beneficial. So papyrus safety plans um, for uh, yeah, creating a safety plan with a person. And um, it just provides some ideas if you have never created a safety plan before. And if you want to learn a little bit more, um, I really recommend the um, Zero Suicide Alliance training. It's 20 minutes long. Um, you don't have to sign up or anything. You can just follow um, the link um, and complete the training kind of whenever suits you. And it is um, yeah, a little bit more in depth about how to support someone. And it's definitely um, a helpful training. Um, you can also become a suicide prevention champion. So if this is something you feel passionately about um, and you would like to get involved with um, kind of furthering this conversation beyond today, um, we'd love to have you on board. We have have um, a group of suicide prevention champions that exist across the southwest of London um, and it's a quite a low commitment role and um, it's quite flexible. It's just about personally and professionally championing suicide prevention. Um, so you'll be aware of the signs, you'll be able to um, start these conversations, um, you'll be aware of services and you'll be um, kind of raising awareness in, in any way that you can, um, as well as kind of networking with the rest of our suicide prevention champions and, and learning from each other about um, how to um, yeah, raise awareness and also support people who, who may be at risk. Um, these are our contact details if you'd like to get in contact regarding um, anything that I've mentioned in this um, uh, presentation today, such as if you'd like a longer suicide prevention session for your team or your organisation or any other um, kind of forums that come up. Um, if you're looking for support around children and young people, um, then there's Anna's email address um, and also Helen's email address, who's here today, um, in case you have any further questions about the work that we do. Um, we really do encourage you to get in touch if you do have um, any questions. Um, but for now, um, if anyone has any questions, um, we'll still be here for a few moments. So, um, yeah, please do um, kind of raise your hand. And I can see um, already there's, there's one hand uh, that's been raised for a while. So, yeah, feel free to kind of unmute yourself and ask any questions. OK, can we have that hand that is up? Because I can't see it. it it's Logie first. And then if we can have um, Councillor Henry and then Councillor McCauley. <coughs> yeah, I, okay. I, have two, I have two questions. One is... Um, these suicide profession courses, do you all have it in schools? Yes, yes. Oh, so, oh, right. The next one is, um, do you all know about camps? Camp no. services for children. Mm -hmm. so. But what I can understand, why camps have we don't operate uh, self-referral and why don't they have 24 7 call? Yeah. Because, uh, because the reason is, uh, I, I was, as I said, the previous uh, issue, I had a, a Zoom meeting with one moment services and a lot of parents were trying to get hold of camps and they just didn't get any help from them. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're saying is, is really right. And, and we're delivering this awareness session in schools, um, but schools often don't have the capacity to take on any training, unfortunately. So it's quite difficult to get that support there. We're also um, offering a papyrus training um, to schools, which is three and a half hours. But again, often they don't have the capacity, um, but lots of people are attending it. Um, it is being taken up. So that is good news that schools are becoming more aware of suicide. Um, when it comes to CAMS, um, unfortunately, um, that, that's not something that's within my remit but I do understand what you're saying that it's really difficult to access often um, it's not as well kind of funded or as well um, resourced as it should be to support our young people who are dying by suicide um, so yeah I hear, I hear what you're saying and, and we'll always kind of take back your um, comments to our commissioner um, because yeah we do agree that um, actually uh, yeah it's difficult to get that support for young people who need it especially through CAMS which is often one of the only routes um, through the NHS. So, um, yeah, unfortunately cannot um, kind of speak because, on um, to improve that, but I do agree with you. Today, today's session was about all the five hours. I had five different cases mm -hmm. and all the children, young people. And out of the five cases, three of them said, this is just good access camps. Yeah. And just we're very worrying about the children. I mean, I don't yeah. see how can, anybody can support the children. I mean, we're really yeah, worrying really, about it. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think a lot of it... I think a lot of it is down to funding, mm -hmm. um, you know, which inevitably all these things are. And secondly, um, waiting lists for CAMS is um, that they're, unfortunately they're just very long. Um, and I think um, they struggle um, to cope with the sheer number that are referred to them. 
um, and to, to prioritise um, children who are in real need. Not saying that none of them are in real need, but it's just very difficult to prioritise. But that really is a school issue. Um, schools not only will have um, CAMs, but they may, some schools may actually have a school counsellor. So, um, and a good pastoral team, um, that's kind of gap filler, but um, it just varies from school to school and, and time restraints. Thank you. I mean, this, this is a sad part of it. I mean, if somebody wants a help urgently, they can't get it. You know, it's, uh, you're risking the child's future. I mean, mm. don't know whether she'll be coming suicide tomorrow or not. We don't know. So, I mean, this is what worries me about the camp service, really. Mm. Thank you, anyway. Yeah, okay. So, it was Councillor Henry, then we have Councillor McCauley, and then Councillor Kajina as well. Right, right. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you for your presentation. And um, two thing, I have a few things I want to ask. First of all, can we have the, um, the copy of your presentation sent out to us, if possible? The next thing is, I think it's a total disgrace to say there's no funding, right? For, for I mean, matter of fact, as we may realize, within the, our borough, the suicide rate is so high where our young people is concerned. And I have experience where we have a young person going through difficult times, school not listen, he, that young person took himself to the camps and they turn him back that he have mm. to be, he have to be referred by, you know, GP or something like that. And these are the things we need to look into and see what is priority, right? Our young people are suffering. And when they reach out for help and they get turned away, what do we expect? Mm. Right, funding. I mean, we have so much money throwing in different different pots, and where it's supposed to go, we are talking about no funding. I think we need to get a grip and realize what is important to our future children. That's 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 how I feel, and I'm really annoyed when I listen about funding, funding for the things which are supposed to be very important. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think you're so right. And it is extremely um, frustrating. I know um, within yeah, Southwest London CCG, there is um, a big push at the moment for more support for children and young people. It is a priority area. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll continue to push it. And um, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to come up with an update on what's being done in the um, area of children and young people. Because you're right, I think there's a lot of children who aren't accessing the support that they need. And you're right, they are kind of dying as a result. So um, yeah, I hear, hear what you're saying. And thank you for, for your comments. Okay, Councillor McCauley. Right, thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, just a few points. In terms of um, safe guiding protocols and also organization that helps, um, I'm going to be referring you to cases of um, domestic violence because um, during the pandemic, as we know, because of COVID-19, there has been a backlog of cases in court, which has... Um, caused a lot of DV cases to be prolonged. And in terms of the courts dealing with the, these cases, this has caused a lot of distress to families who are, and defendants who are waiting for their cases to be heard in court. What I want to know is what um, help that these organizations give and do they advertise what they do, because one of the things we found, first of all, I, I, do, ch I do chair the court in the um, DV court in, in Wimbledon, and it's very difficult when these cases come to court. They make an application, the defendant will make an application for a screen to be put because they don't want to see the perpetrator in face, because we have to be very careful that we grant an application for screens to be um, put up. So one of the things, you know, which has happened in the last two years on DV cases, it has caused a lot of distress amongst defendants who are waiting for their cases to be had. And I wonder whether these organizations are playing a pivotal role in terms of helping defendants before their cases are listed for hearing by mm -hmm. the CPS, the Crime Prosecution Service. Can you have, can I have some comments on that? Thank you. 
Yeah, it's a really important thing that you've raised. We do know that those who um, have experienced domestic violence are um, a higher risk group, and especially if they're going through um, the process which you've described, which can be extremely distressing. Um, so, yeah, we know that, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of charitable organisations that will support um people who are a victim of domestic violence mm -hmm. um, and certainly we would like to work with those organizations to talk about suicide prevention as part of what they do um, so that is definitely something that is within our remit and we would like to do um, in terms of specific organizations that do help with that group um, I can do some research and um, see kind of if there is those gaps and if that that support does exist um, because I believe that um, it, it should do um, and that there there likely is some support there because um, it's a really important group um, and we, we certainly would like to reach those who are a victim of uh, domestic violence. Um, I don't know Helen if you had anything to add on that one. Um. No, to, to be honest with you, I, I, I haven't, um, but it, it is certainly a group that is very vulnerable. Um, the cases of domestic violence certainly have gone up, um, particularly during um, COVID, um, and I'm not using that as an excuse or anything, but um, it's, it's been reported that, that it has. Um, which is very sad and, um, you know, shouldn't happen in the first place. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, those, those groups, um, mostly I would suggest are women, but that doesn't mean to say that men aren't victims either, um, that we would like to reach out to um, from a suicide prevention point of, point of view. Okay, thank you. Agatha? Oh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think it is a shame about um, CAMS and the resources. It's constant resource issues. The government claims to put more money, but don't put any money in any resources. It's just mm. the same old, same old, and we need to do something about it. I mean, I know a young man who recently took his life um, about four weeks ago because COVID didn't help. He was locked up and all this. He couldn't see what he, where his life was going. He was 27, was buried last, last week. I mean, you know, it, it's difficult. How are we going to help our young people? Mm. How are we going to help, help them to realise there is life out there without mm. them thinking that everything is hopeless? And, you know, there's always claim of support, but the support is not enough. You know, mm. you can help as much as you can in your suicide prevention. But, you know, at what stage can you help? We need to be able to try and prevent these things from the beginning or while, you know, while they're still around, encourage them to do things, mm -hmm. have activities, have things for them to do because the way things are going, I mean, I've heard so many suicides and, you know, people as young as they, and it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. and there's going to be more, you know, and I think we, we really have to make it uh, a big issue as to get funding, to be able to support them from the beginning and, see, mm -hmm. and, you know, as you say, get um, champions in schools as well so you can see, you know, any signs of whatever has happened, you know, and not, not to use it as a ticking box exercise because we tend no, to use no, it. Really, not. A lot of these things are ticking box that they'll come here and talk about it. They go to yeah. schools and, you know, and this is people's lives we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So something needs mm -hmm. to be done and we need to keep an eye. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to support them when we need to support them. Resources need to be, you know, applied in the right places. And there should be a lot of resources. We should be fighting for resources. Yeah. You know? And it's not the council resources, the government resources we should be, mm. but that's where it's needed. I mean, men, men, mental health is it's so vast and it's um, blown out of all proportion. Mm. Um, there is such a tremendous need. I mean, we all have mental health. There's no yeah. disputing that. Yeah. It's where we are on this spectrum. Um, and I just don't think we're even scratching the surface mm -hmm. with regard to mental health and supporting people um, who are on the spectrum of having difficulties, being severely um, ill with mental health issues. Um, schools are in turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, not using COVID as an excuse or a reason, but it is. Um, they've been through absolute mm -hmm. turmoil in the last two years. Hopefully they might be back on track of sorts. Um, but again, you know, the, these children that they're, they're attempting to teach um, ha have acquired huge mental health issues yes. and problems. And that their only outlet 
is CAMS, but then as you quite rightly say, government are not putting in funding to support CAMS and to have more councillors, CAM councillors or what, what, whatever they're referred to, um, to help these children, to get them back on an even keel. Um, and it, it's it's sad that we, we're constantly talking about funding, mm. but that's, that is the issue. And it's not, if, if there is funding coming from government, where is it going? And is it going in the right place? Mm. Yeah. And we, we would suggest in this, this, this meeting that it's not going in the right place. Well, I don't think it's going the right place anyway because I've been supporting a, a domestic violence person as well who's, you know, suffering from mental health due to what's been going on, due to lack of housing and due to... Yeah. It's a whole issue, but we have to be able to, you know, support the people, whether you can get them housing or get them... You have to be able to put them in, wrap them up in some kind of safety net. Yeah. You know, without having to say you have to refer yourself go there and, go, and they get more confused and more stressed because once they get to that place, the response they get is more distressing than not going at all. Yeah. So, you know, we really have to try and do something. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. Okay. Well, we will we'll have to move on because we have three other items that's pressing. So we move to item six, Martin Vaccine and Engagement Update by Simon Wadey. Wadi, Wadi. Oh, Wadi's fine. Fantastic. Thank you. It's uh, it's, uh, it's only four letters, but it's amazing the, the pronunciations uh, you get. So thank you. Um, right, I'm just going to share my screen. <laughs> One second. Uh, right, I'm hoping uh, you, you can all see um, my screen. So... Anyway, so uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for the invite today, uh, you know, particularly if you think about today's the second anniversary of when the country first went into lockdown. Um, and, you know, back then, obviously, there was no vaccine um, that only came on uh, just what, just over the year ago now. Um, so, you know, it, it's a it's a very um, uh, point in time, I guess. Uh, but I also like to stress that what I'm going to talk about here is it's not just uh, the NHS. Um, um, a joint venture with our colleagues in public health, Merton, as well. Um, so I feel a little bit of a fraud uh, uh, coming here towards here because, you know, they've done an awful lot of work on this as well. So um, I'd like, they're not here, but, you know, I'd like to express my thanks to them, as well as uh, many of you who we've um, engaged with uh, during this period. And also I feel slightly like fraud because also I've only just started working with we did back in November. So a lot of this was already in train, uh, should I say, when I was there. Um, like I say, you know, two years ago, we, we you know, uh, there was no vaccine when we went into lockdown. Um, we progressed a lot. You think about the first vaccine was in December of 2020. Uh, Maggie Keenan uh, took that jab. And since then, the NHS has delivered 118 million vaccines, which also includes um, 32 boosters. But I'm sure you're more interested in Southwest London. So if we look at that, um, Sorry, I, I can't see my own screen now. I've got myself here. Um, this is where we stand across South West London. Uh, these figures represent about 64.4% uh, of people having the first jab, just under 61% for a second, and boosters standing at about 465 uh, You know, percentage rise, you know, it does change a little bit uh, because of the cohorts coming on. And, you know, we're We've been moving on in the spring to including five to 11 year olds. So, you know, um, we feel like we're a little bit wrapped up in the percentages, but don't, don't worry too much about it. I mean, so if we look at Merton, for example, um, we're about 63.4% of the total population has actually had a first jab, 59.7 um, for the second and 44.8 uh, for the booster. So slightly under, um, should we say, the Southwest London average, but if we break it down into the wards, um, and, I, and I'm not going to go through every ward because you know there's, there's 20 of them. I know that, so I don't really want to bore you too much with the wards here. But if we look at uh, by wards, nine nine wards, 45% of the population in, in Merton have a vaccination rate of over 65%. Uh, these being Cannon Hill, uh, Dundonald, um, Lower Merton, uh, Merton Park, Rainsbury. 
uh, Rains Park and West Barnes. Uh, but then there are five wards that actually have a vaccination uh, rate of below 60. Uh, these are also, as you can see here, the, the, the wards, unsurprisingly, I'll say I'm below 60%, with the most unvaccinated patients per 10,000 of the population. Um, Collingswood, Figs Marsh, Graveney, Hillside, Lambda Fields and Longforton, of which, you know, so these are areas of concern for the CCG and public health. Going further into this, if we look at the turnout into those areas, um, I suppose it'd be unsurprising that the areas with a higher deprivation level, uh, the vaccine take up is the lowest. Uh, this is in amongst those, uh, when we then break down into our groups uh, of people, the um, people who've come from a, uh, a black African or Caribbean heritage, uh, the turnout is lower than um, we would like. Also, between uh, people who have identified as Eastern European, Kurdish, Turkish, uh, and uh, other mixed, mixed white backgrounds, also um, the turnout is low. Uh, also, with uh, um, people identified as a black mixed uh, background, is 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 also low. And people from the traveller community. Um, in amongst this, also, you then look at it a little bit further. Uh, people aged between. 30 to 39 um, are below 60% as well for, for turnout across emergence as a whole. But again, you then go back to places like Fig Marsh. Sorry, I need just go back to my notes on this. Um, the turnout for young people is that the, the age group is wider. It starts at around about the 16 mark and goes all the way up to 49. And we're looking at roughly about 54% of the population. So um, what have we done about this? Um, you know, we are looking, uh, coming up to with the Spring Booster Programme, we're looking, sorry, just to go back, sorry, on the turnouts as well, sorry. And also we are very aware uh, that these communities have also been the hardest hit by the impact of COVID um, and also are most likely to encounter um, other health inequalities. So like I could say, going back to what we've done about it, into spring, we'll be going into about phase three of our um, engagement. Uh, phase one was, you know, we obviously we started talking to people to let them know what's happening but also there we was getting a little bit of feedback from the groups and please don't think that's that feedback process has stopped obviously it continues uh but from that also helped um help us develop where we were going um with the uh with site things like the webinars for example so we could then um tailor them for what people needed so we met with uh, community faith groups um and you know we have probably totaled around about the 60 60 mark uh since february last year um just to go quickly through uh, some of the groups we've been uh, talking to you know we've done um some engagement with the tamil community including a tamil speaking event uh, we've worked with the afro-caribbean community the polish family association i know Savik's not here today he's uh, um, uh, an event at Westminster Abbey uh, to thank him for his uh, input in, into the program. Um, we've also spoke to the Pearly Majid and Al um, Cadhill uh, Institute. Um, also spoke to the Ghanan uh, community, uh, working in partnership with the Ghanaian Union and the Ghanan Nurses Association. There's been lots of there's been some work uh, and outreach work with the homes community, which needs to continue. Um, working with Ready Homes, we've We've done some outreach with um, asylum seekers and uh, they'll be mentioned in pop-ups with just this last Friday, um, Mohammed, um, who's been leading a lot of the actual pop-ups, uh, was at a um, hotel um, in Merton uh, delivering a further uh, vaccines there. Um, only four people came forward for their first dose, but uh, quite a few of the residents had already been vaccinated. Um, we've attended um, traveller community uh, sites, on-site visits, and also the Armudia community, Muslim community as well. We've done some, some work with them. So, you know, we've been out there talking to as many people as we can who are willing to talk to us um, and engage with us. Uh, like I say, a lot of the findings from that. Uh, have been turned into webinars, which people can go online and view. Um, some of them have been tailored to quite small groups. For example, um, just last Monday and Tuesday, uh, the public health team delivered a webinar on um, maternal health um, aimed for uh, ladies from the uh, BME the background. Uh, so again, those are, are ongoing and we are looking at do, doing more. 
um, because we've been very limited in the the reach, the, the actual face-to-face -face, uh, engagement we can do. Um, again, uh, through a lot of our um, outreach, we have uh, provided culturally sensitive social media content, uh, websites and uh, tweets. Um, and now, for example, we will be looking at what we can do um, working with the Muslim community going forward into such things as Ramadan. Um, the Community Champions is a scheme that, again, I mentioned our public health uh, uh, colleagues. Um, this is led from the uh, COVID Champions and uh, now into the Community Champions, and they're there to support the communities uh, to live um, safely and fairly with COVID-19, again, by discussing health matters that are important to members of their community, um, including vaccination and the impact of long COVID, uh, because, you know, um, the, the fallout from COVID is is ongoing, um, and also access to healthcare. Uh, there is a, I think it's a bi monthly meeting they hold to with their champions to give them uh, up to date information, training, uh, and, and things like that. So if you are interested in becoming a community champion, um, please visit the Merton uh, website uh, for, for that, and they will uh, be very keen to to have you. I'm, I'm sure. Um, the pop-up clinics I mentioned now, these are very important because these were introduced uh, to bring the vaccine to communities where uptake is the lowest actually into uh, the community. Uh, but also it gave people the opportunity to come along and just ask a question if they so wished, um, uh, just to, um, you know, uh, any safety concerns or any query about the vaccine they had, an opportunity to talk to a health professional um, and to clarify their points, um, there are still some ongoing at the New Horizons Community Centre. The ones at the New Power Church in Mitcham have, I think have just come to an end, but they will continue at the New Horizons Community Centre. Uh, and around that um, work, particularly at Christmas because of the Omicron um, variant, where we did a little bit of a street ambassador work where we um, got some people on the streets. Uh, this was across the whole of southwest uh, London, but Merton was included in that. And like I say, bear in mind, there was a, you know, a wave of, of Omicron. Um, they still managed to speak to over 3,000 people in Merton um, just to point them to the directions of the vaccine centres, but also to engage if they were going to get their booster or not. Um, it was, I suppose, the figures we look at in the uptake at the beginning of this, this presentation was probably reflected in the conversations they had. But as it was Christmas time, there was a lot of people who were putting off their booster because they were very concerned about being ill um, over the Christmas period, not quite enjoying uh, the festive period as much as they would probably want to um, as well. Um, so uh, that's pop, pop up to this. And yes, and also public health continue uh, to work with BME voice member organizations and the Polish Family Association to discuss wider topics around COVID, that being, you know, testing, um, how to get access to self-isolation support, but also leading a healthier lifestyle. And these conversations continue as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next steps. Like I say, um, we are continuing our work. It doesn't stop. Um, you know, we, we are fully aware that, um, you know, uh, turnout is low in some areas and we need to refresh our approach uh, to this, but, also, we've got coming up is through uh, vaccinations to five to 11 year olds. So we've got another cohort coming. Uh, we're going to be talking to, there is a, a spring booster program. And uh, this has started this week already. Um, and this is for people um, who are age 75 or over, those in care homes or people who are only suppressed uh, for them to come forward six months after their initial booster to book forward. Um, to, to get them because the, the joint committee of uh, vaccination immunization recommend that um that you know again uh the, the resilience to to um covid through the vaccine is deteriorating after those six months and if you think that you know back in december when we start the booster program um it's been estimated that that program has helped prevent about one hundred and fifty seven thousand um hospital emissions since mid-December and that's from uh, data or an estimation from data from the UK Health Security Agency um, but even despite this figure the NHS in the same period has also treated more than 100,000 patients with COVID in, in the same time. The booster program in southwest London I can't give a figure from Merton uh, specifically I'm afraid but is we're looking around about 190,000 um, people will be included 
in that. Uh, but I say that we need to refresh our engagement with, with uh, people who remain unvaccinated. Um, now, I'd really like to hear your, your opinions and your thoughts about what succeeded. You know, what, what has the CCG and public health done well uh, in reaching out and talking to people? Uh, what we could do better? Um, you know, it's a case of we may have done it already. Let's, let's not just throw it, throw it out, but um, we, let's do it again. Uh, you know, we know that there's a reason why people, we, we've got many reasons why people haven't come forward uh, from some of those communities um, to be vaccinated. And, you know, a lot of them were concerns about side effects and long-term health conditions. I think that, um, you know, evidence is now backing us up to say that, you know, the, the concerns, though, though can be founded, um, aren't necessarily as severe as other people wanted to. A lot of people at the beginning didn't trust the vaccine. They weren't too sure it's safe because of how quick it seemed to come through. Um, you know, a gentleman from a, um, um, a black heritage were very concerned about fertility issues. So we've done, you know, what's said about these webinars. We've done some webinars around that. There's concern about people who were pregnant or, or due to, or were actually currently breastfeeding and the safety of the vaccine. So a lot of the, the a lot of the, the the reasons that people aren't coming forward haven't changed. Um, you know, we need to work out still how we can reach those people. These aren't people necessarily who who respond. You know, to uh, people with leaflets on the street. Um, these are people who oh, are not engaging with services completely. So you know, work that Slavak's doing with the Polish Family Association is is incredibly important uh, because you know the way that. Um, sorry, I need to find my um, readout. Um, so people from Eastern European communities, they the way they engage with the health service is totally different because of their background um, in, say, like from Poland, where Slavak is. It's a different type of system. Uh, so not quite UC NHS. So even registering with a GP is kind of alien to them. So we've got many work, bits of work we've got to do here. Um, but we're also very aware that a lot of the people we're talking to have chaotic lives right now. If you, if you, you know, I think we've all seen um, that fuel stress um, is very significant to people with who are financially uh, challenged in their lives, uh, you know, and, you know, is going out and getting themselves vaccinated top of their priority right now. You know, as, as ever, we don't know. We need to find out what, what we can do to get them to come forward uh, as well. Because if you think about some of the feedback we had was about 2% of the people said location was important to them. It's very inconvenient to get to. We can put it into the community, but on that day, it may not be appropriate to them because of their lives. We're very aware that some of the, 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 the some of the bigger vaccination centres are a bit of a bus journey away. And, you know, if you're living on benefits, 155 uh for a bus journey there maybe got held up you got a 155 coming back it's a big chunk of your budget out every day so we are looking at everything we can uh to improve this and any insights any um opportunities we've got to come and talk to some of your organizations or groups uh we i will gladly take up and so my colleagues in public health i mean for example we do um, offer uh, make every conversation count training to you know we're not here to judge. We're here to try and give people the information to make a choice um, and, and then go and hopefully get vaccinated. So we've done some tra training with unpaid carers, for example, to have this type of conversation as well. So, you know, there's there's many ways we can do it. Just let us know what you need and we'll see what we can do uh, to support you. So um, I think that's everything. Um, so oh, for some more information. Sorry, I, I haven't got slides in front of me. Uh, you go onto our websites, uh, you will find uh, lots of information there about COVID um, and vaccinations and where they, where they can be. And, you know, my final thing I should say, I should have added this into the next steps, was that one of the things we are getting back a lot right now is that people feel COVID doesn't exist anymore. And one of the reasons I wanted to point out that, you know, there's 100,000 cases in hospital since mid-December across the country, like in southwest London, um, is that it does exist it is still out there um my son is 17 years old trying to get my 17 year old son uh, or any of his friends to admit they were going to go and get vaccinated is a, is a, a tough ask he's now currently got vaccinated he's now, he's been vaccinated but he's, he's suddenly down with covid there's a little outbreak in amongst his his social group so you know it's still there it's still affecting people and um you know we we we, we just can't rest on our laurels on this so we do need to carry on so um thank you very much 
Do we have any questions? There are questions from Councillor Henry, Grace and Logie. Okay, Councillor Henry. Sorry, my hand's not there. You have Councillor Macaulay. Yeah. Councillor Macaulay. Right. Thank you very much for your presentation, which is very helpful. I think public health have done a brilliant job in getting people to know about this um, vaccination, both the first, second dose, and the obviously the booster as well. And I also feel that most of the churches, especially around Martin, and also our MP Siobhan McDonough has done a lot of publicity. And finally, the BME Voice have actually worked very hard in terms of getting people to get the boosters. One of the things which you I saw in your presentations, I was very um, I was very amused to see that the unvaccinated in the areas of Lavender Fields, Colliers Wood, Fitzmarsh, Graveney Hillside, among and Long Thornton. I was really amazed that Hillside is in the western side of the bowl, is mm -hmm. among those side on the eastern side of the bowl. Because it's, it's, it's um, amazing to say last night we were canvassing in my ward, which I represent in Lavender Fields. And there's two doors which I knocked at, and it was very sad. They were both from ethnic background. And the husband lost his wife and his daughter. Both of them were not vaccinated. And I asked him the reason why. And he said to me, because of social media and the information they were reading, they felt that you know it was going to affect a lot of black people. And I asked him, did you? take the vaccination and he said no he didn't take it because he did not believe that the vaccination was for him and the other family I met exactly the same thing I asked him do you are you aware of the BME voice they've never heard of the BME voice I said have you been looking at the papers to see all the work uh, Martin Public Health has been doing they said well they've seen it but they, they were looking at the negative side of people not being vaccinated. So I think, although there's been a lot of work done, I think there's, you know, in the words which I have just read out, which you had in your presentation, I do feel that we still have time to convince some of these people to have their first dose. And I don't think we should leave, leave them, you know, like not worrying to say, okay, you know, let's, let's not worry about them. We should try and let them get in touch with this organization like the BME Voice, because there's, a, there's an issue of trust among some ethnic minority people. And I think once they speak to a group which is of ethnic background, they may be able to come to terms with getting the vaccination. I don't know what your views are on what I've just said. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Councillor McCauley. Um, yeah, no, just to clarify on Hillside, it is just one section of Hillside, um, just over the border on this east-west divide uh, that's very prevalent in Merton. Um, the rest, as a whole, wet Hillside is about 61%. Um, I, I totally agree um, about the work that the Church's MP, uh, Public Health and BME Voices have, have done um, in response to the, um, to, to the vaccine programme. Um, and I think the conversation you had with the gentleman last night um, correlates completely with a lot of the, the responses we are having. Um, you know, people from, uh, I mean, particularly, I was just looking at a survey response here, uh, you know, that Black Caribbean respondents are more likely to talk to their family members and use Facebook as a source of information, along with, you know, also people from an Eastern European um, background as well uh, look to, to Facebook. And this was also raised, uh, I had a meeting with the Ethnic Minority Forum, Carers Forum, and everyone there on that call had, um, had every vaccination they could, they, could, they could get their hands on. But I think it's the best way to describe it. They had both boosters, so both jabs, were waiting for the boosters, had their flu jab. Um, but even, and I think what you said about his family, they, they wanted the, the unvarnished truth uh, so they could then go back and communicate with their families that are across the world who don't have um, the type of level of information that are open or is available to, to us. Um, 
uh, you know, it's un unvarnished, you know, a, you know, totally scientifically proven and a trustworthy source of the NHS. So um, it's, it's great that people still uh, are engaging with us in that way, wanting to find out the information where they can then pass on. Um, uh, but I want to point out some things, you know, please don't feel that, you know, we are uh, neglecting one. What we're going to do um, in the coming weeks is uh, refresh our programme and concentrate an awful lot more into those other areas, the thick marshes, the long forms long, long uh, of Merton, those type of areas. Um, because yes, no, we don't want to leave anyone behind on this, um, but it's who the message carrier will be. Uh, I'm fully aware that, you know, I may not be the best person to uh, come forward with this message. We need to find the, the right people, people like yourselves, um, to deliver that for us, um, Council McCauley. And, um, we will carry on doing that so whatever you need from us so you can have this information to go forward please let us know um and we will continue to work with the bear me voices to make sure that um, that's available um you know again um we, it's interesting that um what we saw at the beginning some of the responses i saw from surveys uh before i started working here um into in the initial surveys amongst people from an asian heritage for example they wanted to see a bit more scientific data and um, if you look at Merton as a, as a whole in the space that year, um, people from the Asian heritage are um, succeeding, uh, you know, succeeded the what we expect a, a level, you know, our, our baseline level there. So um, that's um, an ethnic group we're not necessarily concerned about on this one. Uh, we can carry on working because obviously there are some important cultural um, holidays and things like that we have to worry about, like, like, like I mentioned, Ramadan. Um, you know, I think we need to also be guided by yourselves. So please um, guide us where you can. That'd be uh, a great help. Who is the next? I think it's Grace next. Um, then Logie, then Councillor Henry. Grace. Hi, thank you so much. Well, that was really um, informative. Very, very interesting, very helpful. Very surprised to see that still 35% have not had their first jab, which is very different from the narrative on the mainstream media. However, I have to say, in terms of your approach, I, I personally feel that the government and the local authority and all the various agencies have worked very, very hard to get the message out there about the vaccination and have actually done a very very good job i don't think there's many people who do not know about the, the vaccination and why we are told to have the vaccination so i think you flogged and pushed and pushed and pushed and that's fantastic i feel that pushing pursuing that same narrative and that same train of thought perhaps we could look and think perhaps that's not going to be productive. And it could actually be counterproductive. I think people need to look at, um, when you look at the first jab and the second jab and then the booster, why it is that percentages have fallen quite significantly. And I think people would feel more willing if they had the full picture. So why is it people are not necessarily coming forward to those who have had the vaccination? Why are they not coming back to continue taking the second and the, the third? I think we need to really start looking at the statistics more deeply. Furthermore, um, we've seen recently that the, um, the emergency, let's just say, we know COVID is there. For sure, we know it exists. And we all know people that have had it at least once, perhaps twice, um, in my daughter's case, who she's a medical you know, student, has had it three times. And um, so it is something that you know, the government has actually decided that despite being vaccinated, we are now going to have to live with it. So not to say vaccinations will not continue, not to say that you do not continue to push the message, but I think how you push it, you need to be careful. I think it's letting people know that there is still a vaccination um, um, program out there and let people have the choice. And I think if you give people the choice, you might find that it, perhaps they take a different approach. I know many people feel forced and pressurized and that actually may put them off. 
And in terms of long term, remember, we're still under the study, which is due to complete in uh, February, I think, 2023. Let us hear what the outcome is of these studies as well. I think people genuinely, if, 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 if by now 35% are still unvaccinated, despite the narrative, despite what we've seen day in, day out throughout the media, they have experienced in their own families, friends, colleagues, etc. they haven't been vaccinated, then perhaps we need to be taking a different approach. And I, I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm just saying that flogging a dead donkey is not going to help. You're just going to, you know, make a situation perhaps more. I mean, I'm just speaking honestly. I mean, I, you know, it's not about psychology. I'm just telling you that I personally, it's not about the black community or the white community. I think if 35% haven't taken it up until now, then we need to, you know, think about why and maybe take a different approach. Um, again, um, the agenda, did, was it the JDC had a, a, a mixed, they turned their decision around uh, uh, of uh, children who were teenage, of teenagers, they initially said, it, you know, the margin was, it was marginal, to, and then they changed their mind. And despite the fact that we don't, we are no longer in an emergency, you've just said about pushing the vaccination to children from five upwards. I personally would want to understand the narrative and the rationale behind that cohort more deeply. Um, I personally have a concern, even if nobody else around this table has one. And I think as a parent, as, as a mother, many people will have a concern. And if you think about 35% of adults not taking the vaccine, what do you think parents are going to do with their five-year-olds? Will they be pushing that agenda? So, I mean, that is something that we really, you know, I, I don't say it flippantly. I mean, the narrative has changed. And as I said, you know, we've gone back to normal. We're not even wearing face masks on the underground anymore. So it is really a having to live with it. And I think while it is still under a test situation, we still do not understand the full outcomes. Should we, as a borough, be pushing the narrative that five to 11 year olds should be going down this route? I wonder. So that's just, sorry to be so negative on that, uh -huh. but I mean, I'm just being frank. You know, these are the real questions that people will ask. No, thank you. Um, I, um... All, all good points. Um, I, I can't comment on the 5 to 11s. I'm not a clinician. Um, but uh, what I could do is share with the group is some insight work we've done into that. Um, I think that you've asked questions that amongst ourselves um, as, in, as engagement uh, professionals, uh, parents that haven't come forward themselves, how likely they are to get their children vaccinated, our people. So th these are all questions we have asked ourselves too. And, you know, the insight work throws some of that, will show some light into that. And um, I guess it will, we'll see where we are on, on, on that, but I will feed that back. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. I should have said this in the presentation and um, I don't know why I didn't. It, the, yes, vaccine, you know, when I was talking about people who have other concerns, um, you know, vaccine fatigue is a real thing out there. Uh, you know, we are fully aware of that. I mentioned fuel stress. You know, I, I spoke to a group of people um, on low incomes. Who, you know, some had, some hadn't uh, been vaccinated. And like I said, they were more concerned about how they were going to get through their daily lives than they were necessarily worrying about getting a vaccine. Um, so I, I can appreciate outside pressures on anyone's life. Um, but what we've got to do is try and make it easier for people to get there. Um, but yes, you're right. The thing, so with the with the idea of uh, vaccine fatigue in mind, um, one of the approaches we are considering, and we're certainly pursuing and, and piloting in, in in some areas. I also look after Wandsworth as well as Merton, um, and that is to make sure that you will see that we mentioned community champions in the vaccination engagement stuff that public health have done. They used to be COVID champions and now community champions because there is that step away that yes, you know what the NHS is, is here. It's always been here for people even throughout the pandemic. 
um, you know, it still operates and there, there, there is a system out there and people have other concerns other than the, the vaccine. We can't keep on just talking about the vaccine. To, if you're already vaccinated, you know, you have other health concerns I'm sure you'd like to, to discuss with us. So um, we will be having conversations about other things with the vaccine could be then tagged on, you know, either at the end of that conversation or three or four conversations down the line. So that is an approach we are uh, looking at doing. So I'm very pleased to hear that... Um, you feel that would be a, a good, good, good way to go on this one, Grace. So thank you uh, very much for that. Um, the links between the first, second, and booster. I mean, but, you know, I don't know necessarily between the first and why I'm coming forward to the second after thing. But people with the booster, it's quite interesting to see. Some of it will be because of cohorts. I mean, during Christmas, for example, um, when we was looking at the boost works when it first started coming out. A lot of people didn't realise that they, they no longer had to wait. I think the six months went down to three months. And there was some data coming through from uh, NHS England that demonstrated there was this time lag um, was, was demonstrating. That then, but then one people noticed that they could then book after three months. Um, they then started coming forward and we saw a little bit of an uptake in, in that booster. But when you're thinking, and it's also because of when cohorts come, come available. So there's, there is a little bit of a lag uh, on that. But... It is interesting to most of the people who haven't had the boost, we know have been vaccinated at least once. Um, a lot of them just say, well, I've, I've had it the once, I don't need it again. Particularly those people who have been second vaccinations, they say, oh, it's another booster, I don't really have a booster. Uh, or we wait to see, because and now I think with the fourth booster, I think they're going to feel uh, there may be some, um, <laughs> they feel correct in their assumption that it's now going to be a yearly thing. Perhaps it will be, I don't know. I'm not part of the JBCI. Um, but there is that little thing. They feel like two jabs is enough for them now. You know, that's why there's that bit of that. Um, but on the other side, you know, I had a conversation the other day uh, with someone who said, you know, I'm clinically vulnerable. I was up for the, in the first tranche of people to be having a booster, but why am I on this full booster? You know, because of the age group and it's only people over 12 who's got a very weak immune system. Um, so there's, there's concern for people out there as well, which we also need to address. And the JBCI will do that, I'm sure. Um, who have the flip side of it, who, who do want another boost, but don't feel they can get it. Um, but we will continue uh, with the conversation, because like I say, there is a woman I spoke to as a carer for her husband, and you mentioned people not having face masks on. This is a, this is a lady who is now staying at home at every opportunity she can, and will only go out if it's only really, really necessary, because she, through sheer fear, she worries that she's by a chance encounter with someone who is on the street without a mask, um, who's, who is um, tested positive uh, for COVID, he's going to carry it home to her husband and she feels that could have a different effect on his, on his thing. So there is many problems um, existing that we need to also deal with other than the vaccine around COVID um, and, and those type of issues are um, very key too. Okay, thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, we can't take any more questions because we still have two other issues that will take time. If you have any question, can you provide an email so I'll, they can email you? I will put it in the chat now for you, yeah, but please remember, I can't answer any clinical questions because I'm not a clinician, so I can just talk about our engagement work. But I will, okay. this one, I can then pass it on, so. Thank yeah. you very much. No, thank, thank you, you very much for your presentation too. Now we'll move on to the police update by Chief Inspector Christopher Scam Scamell. That's correct. Good, um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for holding on for me. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen, um, if you bear with us one sec. Um, bear with us one second. I'll just get this from the start. Sorry. Right. Um, can everybody? Is that being shared? Yeah. It, it okay. Is. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me along this evening uh, to speak to you around um, policing in in Merton um, as part of the sort of um, joint consultancy committee with ethnic minorities. Um, I, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Chris Scammon. I'm the Chief Inspector for Safe and Able and Partnership in um, the South West BCU, and that covers Richmond, Wandsworth, Kingston, and of course Merton. I'm also responsible for the schools officers within the schools in Merton, 
and I'm also the response, lead responsible officer for outreach recruitment, which we're looking to increase the representation um, in the police officers from uh, members of the community from the ethnic minorities. So increasing our representation. Um, so what I've done for, for this evening is just put together um, a, a brief presentation, just a, a summary of the crime figures in and around Merton, um, and then looking at hate crime, some stop and search figures, and, and some trust and confidence. So I've, I've, I've um, this uh, presentation is available on by email if people wish to have it sent to you. I, I have passed it on to the meeting organizer. Um, so I say if you don't, if you want a bit more details and look at it a bit more in detail, um, then the, it can be shared. So in the, in the last year within Merton, um, we've seen 13,000 uh, total offences, um, which is down 1,587 on the year, which is almost an 11% reduction. And in those um, crimes that are of particular interest to the community, um, where people are at risk of threat, of, threat, of, threat and harm, um, burglary has seen a reduction from 956 offences down by 580 offences, which is a reduction of 37.8. Robbery has been reduced by 98 offences to 318, a reduction of 23.6. And weapons offences has gone down to, um, by 17 to 93 offences, a reduction of 15.5%. Where we have seen um, some increases in crime, um, particularly concerning is the increase in sexual offences, uh, which has gone up by 69, um, to, which is an increase of 25%. And violence, we've seen an increase, a small 6.4% increase, which translates to 255 more offences. Um, Could you please start the slideshow? Because we can't really see the, the, the data. I is can't it really not, see it. Is if, it you not start, if you can start a slideshow, so when we know what slide are you talking about, because I just see the overall. Um, yeah, that, yeah. So I'll, I'll not, yeah, sorry, I'm going to come on to that. Thank you. I can't. I, yeah, so I sorry. Is this the screen now with the total offences? Can someone just confirm that this is sharing? No, you're still on the first yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah, on the first one. Yeah. Princess Everett, if you click on to slideshow, it will then. I'm on slideshow. I, I'm, I'm looking at the size, so if that makes sense. No, we're looking at your introduction. Right, let me come out. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. It's on the slideshow now. Right, okay. But that, let me try. that information is in your, your papers. Yeah, it is actually in the pack as well. Thank you. Yeah. It will be easier to see it from the paper than on the screen. Okay, how would, um, is, is that sharing now? Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, this, our, our computers aren't, we've only recently started being allowed to use Zoom on the police computers, so we're not, it's not great on, on our computers. Um, so this is just, I say, I'll quickly fit through, this just shows all the offences across the neighbourhoods by by the different wards and how many offences um, are in the wards. Um, and I've broken it down into violence against the persons, um, residential burglary offences, uh, robbery offences, uh, weapons offences, which is which is quite good, very low across the board, um, sexual offences, so you can see where we're experiencing more sexual offences. Um, so what I've got now is um, I've moved on to look at the hate crime um, instance across the across the borough. And so if you look at the um, the number of hate crimes, it's remained quite consistent um, around between the sort of like twenty to the, the between twenty and forty incidents. Um, some have had multiple victims. Um, and I say we've managed to solve um, at the, in total 11.5% of all the racist hate crime in the, in the year. Some months we've had real success. For example, October we solved 30% of all the crimes, um, but some months we've we've had little success. We do aim to have a 15% um, 
um, detection rate for, for racist crime within across the um, Metropolitan Police and within Merton, we would look to replicate that. So at the moment, we are a bit under 11.5%, but we are working hard um, and it, it does remain a priority within our, within our policing plan to, to address um, racist crime within, within the borough and the entire Metropolitan Police. We've also looked at the number of homophobic hate crime across Merton. I say, fortunately, those figures are, are quite low um, in comparison to other places in London. We have seen some spikes, for example, in uh, May last year, we saw a spike where we had 11 incidents uh, with 15 victims, which was um, an exceptional month. But I say across the other months, we are looking at single figure incidents of hate crime, of homophobic hate crime. And we do have a 16.3% detection rate for homophobic hate crime across the borough. Um, I've looked at Islamophobic hate crime. Again, this is um, this is very low, which I, I'm, I'm glad to say. Although we haven't, although it shows zero detections, we are really, really low. Some months we've had, um, Please to say we've had zero hate crimes in other months, just one or two instances. So um, although one one incident is one too many, quite low instances compared to other other sort of like BCUs across London. So a really good a really good success story there. Um, so I've also looked at stop and search um, in Merton for the. 12 for the months ending March 2021 to the end of January 2022, which are the most recent figures I've got. And um, if we look at those figures that, um, that show the purport, the total number of white, black, and Asians who have been searched, and what those age groups of those being searched are like, and how and um, by gender as well. So, um, one 1,167 white people searched, 1,003 black people searched. And 483 Asian searched, and then others just covers of, of anybody else who does it who is not in in fitted by those descriptions. And you see the majority of those searched, um, 367 in the 15 to 19 age group, followed by 20 to 24, and then 20 to uh, 20 to 29. Um, and the majority, 922 of the people searched are male, compared to 81 female. So I've um, looked at the ethnicity of appearance of the people, so all, all the people searched. Um, and that shows sort of, again, the total num the numbers over, over the period of time. Um, and, and within this um, graph, it also shows the number of searches per 100,000 population, per 1,000 of population. So, and this is where you can look at the um, disproportionality of, of stop and search. Um, so, I'll give, so I'll just do, for example, um, February 2021, um, there were 151 white people searched, which worked out at 1.2 per 1,000 population. Uh, there were 90, 99 black people searched, which worked out at 4 per four person search per thousand population. So you can see that's about three and a half times um, more likely to be searched. And that's, that um, is replicated throughout the year where you see if you go along along the year that um, black people are three to four times more likely to be searched on average um, in, in Merton. And Asian people also uh, between one and two times more likely to be searched than a white person in, in Merton as well, um, and I say so, and that and that highlights um, some of the disproportionality of, of stop and search in Merton, which is probably reflective of what is um, the situation in other boroughs in London as well. Um, this is the the trust and confidence um, for the police in um, Merton. The, the these are done. This is a measured by the public attitude survey. Um, the questions that people are asked are across the top um, and the numbers given are a percentage. And if you look at Merton, um, none of our red is red is where is where there is a real lack of confidence. Um, and then it sort of graduates up through orange, 
yellow, light green and green. So although um, we're not red like, if you imagine, sort of like some of the other boroughs like Lewisham and Hackney, um, we're not we're not green. So I say we, we're aware there's a lot of work to do locally, which we are really, really concentrating on and how we build that trust and confidence across all the communities in in the um, in the borough. Unfortunately, this I don't get this figure broken down into um, trust and confidence from different community. The sample size of the survey isn't enough to do to do that. Um, this is just total um, across the um, trust and confidence in the police across those questions across the entire borough and how that and how that compares with with, with the rest of London. Um, and I say I'll, I'll come. I'll, I'll stop sharing and and come back. I know that was quite um, a whistle stop uh, tour of, of a presentation um, and, and just giving an, an idea of, of the situation. And I say, and if I if I if I get invited back and for next time, just um, get a bit of an idea of what people would like in in that sort of presentation going forward as well. So it's the first time I've done it. Um, and if there's anything else that you'd like me to produce or any further information that you'd like me to, to give to you, then, then please let me know and, and I can do that for, for next time. And I know um, there's a couple of hands up. Agatha, and sorry, I'm, I'm not sure who it is. It's NTCG Dayspring, I'm not sure. Yes, it's Sharon, sorry. Oh, I, think, sorry. I think my hand went up before Councillor Agatha's, so I'll jump right. in. Yeah. Yeah, just, just two things. One, um, I know this happened in Acne, and Hackney is not the same as to um well, Palladil, et cetera, Merton. But um what what is being done in your division to ensure we don't have um a repeat of what happened in Hackney with um baby Q, um girl Q. That's one. And two, uh, yeah, how can you safeguard against us or reassure us that? you are safeguarding against that happening. And two, um, how do you see the church and the police working together? What can the church do in your estimation to help what you do, to complement what you do? Yeah, um, so um, I've, I've, I was working in Hackney before I came to, to um, the South West and Merton on promotion. So um, I am familiar with, 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 with the circumstances of that. It should, ne it should never have happened. Um, I don't think, I think there will be, with, there are, so, you know, I, 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 to say stop it happening again, I can't believe, I can't believe it happened. I don't think um, the school was blame, totally blameless within it, with um, the, the situation with um, the officers, the way the officers were called um, to somebody had already been searched for, for cannabis and then the school still believed they had on them and then the officers had to go in and, and pick that. I'm not making excuses. Um, they weren't safe for schools officers um, who, who work in the schools. We have safer schools officers embedded who we work really, really, who work really, really closely with the schools um, and are slightly more experienced and have that extra experience of dealing with young people uh, and earn the, earn the trust. There's guidance around strip searches, um, how they should be completed. It's being re, re, um, reinforced. The training's going back out there. Everyone's getting re, re, re the guidance has been recirculated. I, I think the, the publicity around it, I don't think officers would do it again. I, there is, there are so many safeguarding safeguards in, in, in place, it's just sometimes you just it's, you can't allow for people's, it's all, I don't want to say stupidity, but it, it feels like that, that, you know, we can put everything in place and then someone goes and it, it breaks my heart because it, it affects trust and confidence within, within the community and particularly within the black community where our, our trust and confidence is fragile at, at the best of times. Um, um, and it, it, it really has a damaging effect on that. Within, you're, you're totally right, we have um, two faith officers who work full-time faith officers within Southwest um, who engage with our faith 
um, with churches, mosques, synagogues, um, within all, all, all of the religions, and they are working closely with us to um, build those relationships with churches. And you, you know, and it's it's getting the good the good work recognised as well because we could every we, all the good work that we do do and um, positive community interactions. Um, faith engagement, community engagement, it is all, it, all the good work is undone by, by, by a couple of officers in, in one instant. And I say, I, 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 there are safeguards in place. I say within schools, I know um, some, within Hackney that there's now a bit of resistance to police officers being in school. I'm not getting that sense um, within our boroughs, I feel that we, we do have within a lot of the schools good working relationships and I really want to continue that. Um, and I, I would be confident that it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen again. I think everyone's, the publicity with both internally and externally, that I don't think any officers would, would do, do, do anything of that nature, nature again. Um, who was next? Was it Agatha? Yeah, thank, thank you for your um, presentation. Um, we're talking about Merton, what will happen in Merton is at the moment, um, the cabinet member for education and myself were trying to look into safeguarding in the schools, the police in the schools to make sure that things are as they should be and things like that don't happen in this borough. You know, we know we've got um, good policemen in there, but you have to reassure ourselves they are generally doing what they're supposed to and they will be generally following the safeguarding. The school should be following the safeguarding. I can't fathom why the school in Hackley, they did not follow safeguarding and were allowed such a thing to happen. So I think a lot of the boroughs are having speaking, spoken to other cabinet members in, in various boroughs. They are also taking on board to have a look and make sure that their safeguarding are uh, appropriate and carried out and also with, with the police as well. So I think it sort of spooked a lot of people because you know what we were hearing outside that this wasn't this is not the only case. I don't know what you know what is, but if there's more cases in different boroughs, then there's going to be a real issue of losing confidence in the black community because yeah. what what the Met oh, is trying to do is sort of gather conf, uh, um, confidence and um, be able to associate themselves and mix with it ethnic and various communities, but it's not a very good way of doing it no. or showing people that you can do it. So and, no, no. and we have to be we have to be very um, open and straightforward. You know, things happen, you know, people have the idea that things happen and the police cover up for each other. So you know until we lose that sort of idea that the police are covering up for each other, it's very difficult. You know, we try to defend the police in my position. You know, try to defend the because we've got good police officers. But when you get, you know, one or two that come up, or three or four that come up, and there's been other issues with violence against women, it makes it difficult for people to actually think. They know there's good police officers there, yeah. but the more we keep coming up, they think there's something it, not right. Mm, so I think, right. you know, and they, they feel that they just take anybody into the police service now. They don't check background, check them, and they just accept people. I know we're desperate for it. So we have to reassure people that these things are not so, and we will you know, sort of look at things in a, in yeah. a better way. I did want to ask you, stop and search. Are we not giving, did we not give le um, notes or leaflets or um, uh, a receipt to young people when they're stopped and so oh, we stopped that? So, no, they should, we used to fill out um, yeah. the stop and search form, pad, but yeah. now, now um that they they've gone to tablets they should just we were giving out like little slips to say that you had been stopped and searched with a reference number on um so they should still get those and we are going what, what will be launched short, shortly is um also a qr code so when someone is stopped and searched they'll have um the police officer will have a qr code that can be scanned on, on the young person's phone, which will go to a Know Your Rights page. So we used to give out the Know Your Rights um, 
mm -hmm. leaflets as well. But I think like we're trying to move with uh, modern technology. You know, people don't want pieces of paper, so just a QR well, code. I on, think it's a bit. Yeah, I don't believe in that QR code, but that's me personally. Yeah. But yeah, I just think, because I, I was speaking to a parent today who was quite distraught, their son was stuck, you know, and 16 year old, he was stuck. And no, they didn't explain why. He, um, I, I said, I'm sure they explained it. But they gave him no sort of um, paperwork and nothing, just stop him. You know, and he's never, I think he's a good boy, he's never been stopped, but he was quite shocked and quite surprised. He should be offered a, offered a copy of the. Yeah, that's what I say. They just, uh, I'm glad that's what yeah. I just wanted to ask you. So yeah. I can actually tell them that it's still going because I said to her, it is to happen. Well, obviously, it's not happening. So I think yeah. you should enforce the officers that they must do it because at least the parents know why their children have been stopped. Yeah. And we do. If you're, we trying, do if, you're trying, if you're trying to get good communication and, and win the words and win the people yeah. over, you're not doing a good job by not doing that. So yeah, we no, must. 100%. Yeah, um, and we do have the community monitoring group in place to, who scrutinise stop and searches and um, yeah. regularly regular meetings um, and come in and do body worn video viewings as well at the police station. Random, randomly selected um, stop and search to see how the police officers behave and body worn video as well, make it, uh, making officers more accountable. And we do have yeah. really like high in the high nineties for. 90% high 90% to um, compliance rate with officers using body worn videos. Um, is it Councillor Henry or Grace? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't see whose hand went up next. Oh, well, I'll, I'll jump in there quickly. Yeah, it was Grace. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, Councillor Agatha, I think the police do a phenomenal job, really, an excellent job. And it's always a few bad eggs that really ruin it for everybody else. But I still want to bring to light, uh, obviously, the uh, child's cue and what was came into the media this week on the back of Daniel Morgan's uh, case which was they found the police to be institutionally corrupt and shocking. Um, and with Cressida Dix, uh, is it Cressida Dix stepping down? Um, I, you know, obviously perhaps things that we, the police could look at is training and, um, you know, integrity and going back to the drawing board and looking at themselves internally. But going back to the um, your statistics with um, stop and search, you talked about the black what the white boys is one point two on average, black boys uh, four in every uh, thousand get stopped. Yeah. And my and I think in Merton you said ninety nine were stopped. It'd be interesting to drill down and just to know of that ninety nine were any of them justifiable were they justifiable i mean it's okay to say stop and search but what was the outcome so that you know we can see whether oh, yeah. our concerns are genuine or actually 99 were caught with yeah you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, good yeah to know because it's, you see because it's about you know knowing the reality behind we we'll now look at we would then be able to look at our approach and our integrity yeah. Um, yeah, so those things are available. I just didn't know how much detail to go into for for this meeting. Um, and what the figures do show in general is that the outcome rates are, are pretty similar. The, in, a, in around the 25, 26 percent mark for both you know, black and white people, black and white um, children, younger people, is that that will be the, where something is found will be in about a quarter of all. So basically, cases. you're saying 75 of those 99 basically were stopped unnecessarily. So it, it shows that we do need to go back to the drawing board and look at yeah, the whole rationale behind. I think there's yeah, there is there is a whole a whole we could spend yeah. hours talking around stop yeah. and search and yeah. the pluses and, and the minuses. Yeah, and just one more thing about the um, child queue because it, it's not just an emotive. It's, it's raw, it's personal to so many of us around this table who have children and who have girls. I mean, we take it like this happened to our own children. It's quite traumatic. But in terms of the police officers and the teachers involved, the decision to not make it a criminal or to put them on in the spotlight 
to protect their identity, I think is really quite shocking. And, and this is the problem. This is where the police form that wall of protection around the police. And therefore we don't seem to be able to make any steps forward because actually there should be a, there should be a criminal, criminal offence. There should be a criminal uh, situation, not uh, uh, just an inquiry. We've had a lot of Stephen Lawrence inquiry, McPherson inquiry. So many inquiries happen in this country and it's like another trauma because we have another inquiry, and actually there should be a prosecution. They, they are they are they are under investigation yeah. okay. um, by the IOPCs, which is separate to see to see what what it was. At the moment, I think it is a misconduct inquiry as opposed to like a criminal investigation. But the IOPC, if there if there are criminal offences. Um, yeah, I mean, many of us thought that is a criminal offence that happened. Yeah, it's not a conduct. This is not a mis. Um, this is not about not being professional. A crime was committed against a child on this occasion, and we need to call it out for what it is actually. And again, yeah, sure. this is the of protection that I feel the police often build around themselves. They have they build this secret. And and therefore we never really get to the bottom of what really, you know, is going on, or you know, the the the, the perpetrators seem to yeah, go. I, I, so I can't. I don't know. I'm what the. I, I don't know what the um, parameters of the. Well, the yeah. whole incident will be investigated by the OPC, which is independent. So it's not police investigating police. It's an independent. Yeah. And uh, and if there are criminal char criminal offences that are yeah. identified, then 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 that is. Okay. That, that will be pursued. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henry. I thank you. And now thank listen, you. listen before Joan come. We are I'm running sorry. out of time and we still have Ben to come on. So Joan, please make it quick. Oh, thank you, Councillor Skeet. Okay. <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. Um, I just want to say um, I was a special constable, 1996 to 2011. And during my time, we had training every six weeks. We have to train again with the regulars on different occasions, different topics. And I'm just wanting to find out if our present police officers are going through any further training after leaving training school. Because as far as I can see and understand and learning, it doesn't seem like they are getting up their training. And this is really bad because, you know, our officers are not really performing the way like we were training, training school, as soon as it appears to be when they come in the road, they just do their own thing. They're not going towards what they were trained as. No, no, just I'll just deal with that very quickly. I know Councillor Skeet, um, I joined in 1996 and I had training every six weeks. Mm -hmm. That's not happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's there's not the time, there's only a limited number of training days built into the police um, roster per year and it's not sufficient it isn't mm -hmm. sufficient I think that's something we need to start looking to then we'll have better police officers because I tell yeah. you even though in, during those days we used to have a little bit bias in things but the officers yeah. weren't as I don't know if they're scared they're scared now or they're just bossy or just the uniform you know let me feel well I'm powerful I can do what I want to do and I'm going to bring you to something um, about Two months ago, my grandson went football. He came home and he said, Nan, I'd like to get a charger for my phone. He went out to get a charger. And, you know, I said, hey, he has me back. Then I heard my door knock. When I realized there was about six police officers outside with my grandson in handcuffs, I said, what is this for? And he, when he was so upset, he started to, you know, really make noise. He said, Nan, I went to buy the charger. So walking towards Mitcham Town Center, then these officers jump on me, where I'm going, wanted to search my bag. I said, why? Cut story short, they searched, they didn't find anything, but they decided to put handcuffs on him. Anyway, when they brought him in, I said, bring, I said to them, come inside my house, sit in my chair and tell me what happened. At the end of the day, they do apologize to him and say that, okay, that was the area where drugs area are. And they were just, you know, they searched him and he was making noise. So therefore they put him in the, in the handcuff and put him in the vehicle. Suppose I wasn't at home, you know, what would I have done? Take him to the police station? 
you know, and six officers. So these are the things that we want to, you know, at our police station, try to listen to your, the children sometimes when they talk to them and not only, you know, judge them or thinking that, okay, they are doing the right thing and the child is wrong. You know, I'm happy that they brought him home and I'm happy yeah. that we have a good conversation and I'm happy that they listen to what I was saying and they apologize to him. They apologize to me and my child apologized to them of swearing at them. So we just need to, uh, you know, something needs to happen. We need to get some change. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, and I say for next time, if there is anything that you want, like a deeper dive into whether stop and search or anything like that, if you let Everett know and, and she can tell me what you want, um, and I'll, I'll leave you to finish the, the rest of your meeting. But thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. you pronounce your name. Scamil. Scamil, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Well, Ben, I'm very sorry. You have waited and waited and waited, oh, but no, now it's fine. your turn. I'm just mindful of the time. It's 20 past nine. I don't know. You had six presentations. I think I'm better off to send you our service brochure. And if you have questions, you can send emails to me. But I think there's no point at almost 9.30 in the evening to, Thank uh, you give very you another, much. to give you another 20 minute presentation. I don't think it's quite useful. Is that OK? Yeah. I'll send you yeah. the brochure, and if you have questions, you can send me an email, please. Send send it to Everett, and then Will we do. can email or text you or call you and ask you questions. Okay. Thank ben, you, you can always you can always come back. You can try come to, uh, back to the next try, meeting. Try to for, to the next, to, for the next midnight to, session at 10.30 then, yeah? Trying to dodge out of your session. You can always come back. Yeah, these, right. well, well. Well. Ben, if you questions. come back to the next session, I'll put you at the top of the Let's, agenda. No, let's see. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, let's put him at the top. Bye bye. Bye. Any other business? I hope none. Yeah. Well, good night. It has been a very packed meeting. We try some cases tonight. Yeah. But I think it was edifying. Thank you very much for attending and see you later. Thanks, bye. everyone. Okay, good night. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. bye, -bye. Good night, good night. Good night.